All right, so lipids, triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. Your parents and I grew up in a time when people uh, were told, we were told that uh, low fat, low cholesterol uh, diets were the way to go. Uh, and unfortunately, this has kind of backfired on the United States, and uh, a study out of Cambridge started uh, to put this into question, and many studies since then have really uh, put a damper on the idea of the ideal diet. We're not sure what's going on yet, uh, but studies clearly have started to point towards uh, fats aren't that bad for you, and saturated fats may not be all that bad for you. But we know that tri uh, or trans fats are very bad for you, and certainly we don't want most of our calories coming from lipids, and hopefully by the end of this you'll understand why. And also by the end of this you'll understand what, what is a fat and what is a lipid in general. So as I said, there are three types of lipids. There's triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. And in sterols, we're talking about things like cholesterol, um, you know, and other steroids. That's where ster comes from, right? There's they're, they're ring structures, ring carbon ring structures. Remember, everything, all the macromolecules we discussed, all four of the types of macromolecules are all carbon structures in one way or another, all carbon bonded to another carbon, to another carbon, to another carbon. Uh, which, you know, do you have, if you have nitrogen in it, you're probably thinking proteins or, or in the case, or DNA, uh, but certainly not carbohydrates. And lipids also don't have any nitrogen in them. If you're thinking carbon and oxygen, a lot of carbon, a lot of oxygen, then you're thinking uh, just carbon and oxygen and hydrogen, then you're thinking, and you must be thinking uh, carbohydrates. If you have just a little bit of oxygen and long carbon chains, then you have to be thinking lipids. We could have carbon rings. Now, you remember that one of the things we're going to test is the difference between these carbon chains, the fact that carbon can make chains, long chains, and the fact that carbon can branch, like in, uh, like in uh, uh, polysaccharides like uh, cellulose or uh, starch, especially starch. So carbons can branch, or carbons can form rings. So they can be straight chain, they can be branched, they can form rings, and they can form all kinds of other interesting shapes, as in proteins with all the second, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structures. Now triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols, uh, like DNA, are simpler in that they're not, they don't have as many options, and there aren't as many kind of uh, uh, considerations. Proteins are much more interesting, but also more complicated. Again, I, I want to mention this again because it's probably going to be on the test. Is this idea that initially we the scientists thought that proteins were the key to holding the genetic information of every organism because amino acids uh, were so varied in their their chemistry and their structure. They're more interesting. They're more, they could hold, obviously, if you're going to pick a uh, uh, if you're going to pick an alphabet, you'd probably want to pick an alphabet, they thought, uh, of something like 20 letters rather than in DNA, uh, uh, an alphabet of only four, an RNA, an alphabet of only four, and, and lipids, um, not much, uh, much less variation in, in the types of, um, of uh, structures you can get or combinations you can get. Let's take a look at the, what we're talking about. When we're talking about triglycerides, we're talking about things that are fat and oil. So when you're putting, frying something in oil at home, you're talking about frying in, frying in stuff that's, that's, they're pretty much all triglycerides. They predominate uh, in food. Anything you eat is probably mostly triglycerides. Uh, they're, they're a major storage form of fat in the body. So everywhere you have fat, they're stored in these triglyceride molecules. And there are ma they are macromolecules, very large molecules, and they're stored in your adipose tissue. Those are cells that are made to store fat. Uh, the structure is composed of three fatty acids and a glycerol. And we'll take a look at what that means in just a second. So a fatty acid, let's think about that first. One end of the fatty acid, and these are, uh, I see that you see that they're chained. This is the shortest kind of fatty acid you can have. On one end, you'll have a methyl group, let's see, with three H's on it. And on the other end, you'll have a carboxylic acid. Now remember, just like an amino acid, this end makes this molecule an acid. 
Acid meaning it can release a hydrogen, it's acidic, etc., etc. And we'll talk more about what an acid is uh, a little later. And Mr. Despeta, I'm sure, will speak to you about it as well. But in any case, this the length of this fatty acid can change, and some of its qualities can change as well. But on one end, if you see a molecule with one end having C double bond OH or some combination, remember when you do uh, dehydration synthesis, this becomes a link between this chain and something else. And this usually kind of sticks out, just like in sugars, just like in proteins, this carboxylic acid end is usually the one that's involved in, uh, in some type of dehydration synthesis is no different with fatty acids. So here you have a glycerol molecule. It's basically just three carbons long. So this glycerol molecule is pretty simple, pretty straight, and it's a pretty straightforward molecule. The hydrogen here is off the screen, but it's three carbons long with hydrogen on each side. You'll notice that there's the carboxylic end of, the, of this fatty acid, and this carboxylic end has, is, has been used to attach it to this glycerol molecule through dehydration synthesis, and H and OH have left, and you have this linkage. This is called an, an ester linkage, and so you have a glycerol, three fatty acids. This is a triglyceride, triglyceride. Glycerol makes the word glyceride, and of course the fatty acids are here on the end. There's three types of fatty acids shown here, three of them. The first one that we're going to talk about is this saturated fatty acid, the one that everybody thinks may be bad. It's still, it's still in contention. Some people think it's not as bad as we thought. Others think it's still, it's still pretty bad. Stay away from it. It's probably a good idea not to eat too much of this, but it's better to eat butter, for instance, than margarine, where butter has saturated fatty acids, where uh, uh, margarine has trans, sometimes has trans fat, which is much worse than for you. So saturated fatty acids come from animals, and so hence butter comes from milk, which comes from an animal. And with saturated fatty acids, what you have is all these carbons. Now, why? And here's a question someone asked. Let's make sure everybody is aware of it. Why is it that we have this up and down business with this chain of carbons? That's so that you can see where each of the carbons are. Remember, just like in sugar, where there's a point where the two lines connect, that's a carbon. Because every all the chemistry of life is about carbon. So here you have the carboxylic acid end, then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, then 16, and then, so this fatty acid is 16 carbons long. And all of these carbons, because you don't see any O's on it or any other atoms, and you don't see any double bonds, all these carbons, remember they have how many bonds for each carbon? I hope you said four. And that's one of the things that they from the one of the uh, from the original uh, PowerPoint back oh, weeks ago, where you had to remember that was one of the basic things you had to learn and remember that each carbon can form four bonds. This carbon has one, two to the oxygen, it has one to this oxygen, and it has one to this carbon. So there's four bonds on this carbon. This carbon has one hydrogen here, one hydrogen here. It's bonded to this carbon here, and it's bonded to this oxygen here. So this carbon has four bonds. This carbon has four bonds. This one has four bonds. This one has four bonds. This one has four bonds. Every carbon you see has four bonds. So when you're looking at this carbon here, it's obviously connected to this carbon. The other line connects it to this carbon down here. Where That's only two bonds. Where are the other two bonds? Well, I hope you said that there is a hydrogen here that we're, it's not shown, the hydrogen is not shown, and it won't be shown because we don't want to draw a bunch of hydrogens down the chain. So there is a hydrogen that's implied, just like the one in front of the X in algebra. This hydrogens, these hydrogens are assumed that if you don't, if you don't see anything, that's assumed that you know that there's a hydrogen here and a hydrogen here. So there's four bonds on each one. One, two, three, and four. This one has four bonds. One, two, and then the hydrogens you don't see. Three and four. Here's two bonds on this carbon. One, two, and the two hydrogens you don't see. Three, four. All the way down the line, there's these hydrogens. Now, why do I bother telling you that? Well, it's important that you understand that because that's what saturated means. That means every carbon in this chain has a hydrogen. 
So the carbons are saturated, or what, another word for saturated is full, right? They're all the bonds are full. They all have something attached to it. Now, as we move further down the, the line here on this one, this has one, actually two carbons, but one set, one set of carbons, one set, one pair of carbons that don't have hydrogens attached to them, which means that their bonds are not full. You have two. Well, we know that nature says it, it w that they have to have a, uh, a, the electrons to be, uh, they have a full octet. They have to have the bonds. So what they end up doing is double bonding. They end up sharing two bonds with each other so that they can have their four bonds because as we say, carbon has four bonds always in nature. So we call this kind of bond a mono. Now we said it saturated means it's full of hydrogens. So we have to say not saturated, but unsaturated. So what that means is that when you look at it, there's only one pair of carbons that doesn't have a, a, a hydrogen on it. That's a really important idea. Now, so far we have a saturated, which means they're, all the bonds are full of hydrogens, right? And then we have this one pair of carbons that don't have hydrogen, so we call them monounsaturated. They're, they're not saturated. The only thing that's not saturated are these two, or mono, this one pair of carbons. But here we have two, so two or more, two or more, as we've been saying for almost every mac macromolecule on this test that you're going to be testing on. Two or more means poly, and here we have, uh, therefore, a polyunsaturated fatty acid, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So poly we have saturated, we have polyunsaturated, we have monounsaturated, and we have polyunsaturated. It's clear then that what we're dealing with is uh, this idea that when we're looking at fatty acids, we can have any one of these combinations. Of course, we would love to have uh, a fat or fatty acids that are only come from the polyunsaturated area in your diet. So olive oil would have polyunsaturated. Any plant is going to have poly, uh, mono or polyunsaturated. All right. So then, of course, any animals can have a lot of this saturated animal meat, like steaks and pork, etc. is going to have saturated fatty acids. All right, let's take a look at, let's go a little deeper into this idea of fats and triglycerides and maybe look at some sterols. Well, one thing I want to make sure you understand about fatty acids and the difference between polyunsaturated saturated, and saturated fatty acids is it impacts more than than health, you can tell just by its physical and chemical structure. So the fact that you have straight chains, right, of fatty acids allows the fatty acids to line up on each other. When these things have double bonds, when these fatty acids have double bonds, as in unsaturated fatty acids, the molecules, instead of being in, instead of being a, you know, Instead of being in a line, the way you see here, right? So these would be saturated. They're saturated, so they're really, they really don't have, uh, you know, there's, no, there's nothing bending them. There's no bend, real stiff bend in them. They can lay down one on top of the other. So they're more likely to be solid at room temperature. Where if you have, on the other hand, a... Uh, um, an unsaturated fatty acid, what you have is you have a straight line until you get to that double bond, and then there's a kink to it, and then it might keep going. So these are a little tougher to line up. They don't like to line up it as, a, as, a, as a solid because they, remember, light charges were kind of repel. And this kind of these bends in saturate, uh, uh, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fats, they end up being liquid at room temperature. So one of the impacts of having this double bond on each of these molecules that you saw on the previous slide is that you have a liquid form of the of the fat. So something like uh, olive oil is liquid at room temperature. Where butter that comes from animal fat, so like milk, uh, in the case of buttermilk, that 
and also in the pan when you're done cooking bacon or you're done cooking uh, uh, a steak what you'll notice is that the, in the pan there's going to be this solid kind of gooey white stuff or sometimes a little yellow uh, depending on the seasons you you add it could be even a different color but it's going to be uh, it's going to be buttery or, or like lard after it hardens so at room temperature once it the pan cools down it'll, it'll look a lot like butter in its consistency in the texture where if you take some french fries and you fry them in oil when you're done frying them that fr those french fries that oil is still liquid and the reason it's still liquid is that it has all those double bonds it's unsaturated where the reason the f the meat uh, the fat from meat and the fat from butter turns into that solid hardening stuff is because they're saturated they can lay down one on top of the other as they cool down they just lay on top of the other and become a solid where these kind of keep rolling around and refusing to settle down so they turn into liquids they stay liquid so the chemical structure the the structure of the molecules actually in, uh, impacts the what you see when you're cooking when you cook it the these fats it does change them and if you burn it for instance if uh, anybody that, that there's any kind that watches Chopped or, or any kind of cooking show, you know, if you burn the oil, you really can't use it. I'm sure you've gone to a restaurant where they've used old oil. You can taste it. Uh, there's a change. The oil turns rancid. It it uh, it starts to break down, and it's it's not very good tasting. But also, it's probably unhealthy for you because you can change some of these fats into trans fats. These double bond, these single bonds are not trans fat. They're straight. There's no trans or cis to them, but these can be trans or cis, and the trans version of these fats is bad for you. Now you may have rem you may remember when we talked about thalidomide that you can have the different stereoisomers, and these stereoisomers can be cis or trans. That's what we're talking about here. Since you have a, anytime you have a double bond, you can have two versions of the same molecule. One molecule, one version being good, the other being bad. We looked at what thalidomide, what happens with thalidomide. This particular molecule, when we see the cis or the trans, the good one being uh, cis and the bad one being trans, when we get that shift to trans, that's not very good for us. It actually has a lot of negative uh, health impacts. Now, when we take a look at the length of the carbon chain, again, this is just 18 carbons long. There's your carboxyl end. There's your methyl end, right? Your CH3, the so end is capped. And in the center, of course, you have your 18 carbons from end to end. Both of these are the same 18 carbon, saturated. So in other words, there's a hydrogen on each one. There's just two versions. See, here's the ones without seeing the hydrogens. And the reason this isn't all kinked up and down uh, is because this, uh, this is just showing you where the carbons are. Since we're not, we don't have hydrogens, it's, it, unless you draw a C in the middle of each of these, it wouldn't be very useful but being able to uh, you know it's, again it's a simplified structure but it's good enough for us and we draw these in science because it's easier to draw them if you're drawing a few hundred of these on a board it's easier to draw this than this right it saves time shorthand and as I try to teach you with Cornell notes shorthand is you practicing your own shorthand making sure you follow the shorthand that other people use appropriately is really useful for uh, making your life a lot easier when you're taking notes or when you're translating them. So when you're talking about again saturated fa uh, fatty acids what are you talking about? Your, uh, saturated fat has usually three fatty acids they're all saturated and you just saw what that means. Um, it's things like butter and lard all right, animal fats and some tropical oils like coconut or palm also have the now these are vegetable oils these are the exception to a vegetable uh, these are exceptions to vegetable oils being unsaturated saturated fat is tends to be animals but you do have some tropical plants that produce this saturated fat and that these things tend to be solid at room temperature as I described earlier now unsaturated fats again monounsaturated have have uh, one double bond where uh, polyunsaturated have two or more double bonds. So in canola oil and olive oil, you have one double bond in that in that chain of carbons. And the in polyunsaturated, two or more double bonds. So things like 
corn, sapphire, soybeans, uh, sunflower oil, and fish. Corn oil is actually better for you than, than in a lot of other types of oils. Um, so it's interesting that polyunsaturated does such a, a good job. Now these, all these oils are going to look uh, liquid, are going to be li liquid at room temperature. Um, where the saturated fatty acids are going to be at the same temperature are going to be solids. So here's oleic, oleic acid and linoleic acid. These are two examples of the monounsaturated for oleic acid and polyunsaturated for linoleic acid. These are important oils in your in your body. They're essential oils. Here are uh, here's your carboxylant. Here's your methylend. And again, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated. They both have 18 carbons. It's just this one's going to taste different. It's going to do different chemistry because it has two extra, one extra double bond or a pair of carbons that is not saturated. Notice it's not saturated. There's no hydrogen here. Where you, if you remember from the saturated one, there'd be hydrogens all the way across because all of the spaces would be filled with hydrogen, hence full or saturated. So this is an interesting uh, diagram. This one, this is just for your edification. It's really not going. I'm not going to test which which oil is uh, which specific oil is is polyunsaturated, which is monounsaturated, etc. But I will tell you that I will. I may ask animal fat. We know, and of course, tropical oils. We know are going to have saturated fat in them. So if I give you animal fat or beef tallow or whatever it is or lard, you should be thinking saturated fat. An interesting point here is that coconut oil has um, uh, has more saturated fats than than butter and beef uh, or beef tallow. And lard actually has less saturated fat than coconut oil or butter. So people that are upset about how your uh, great-grandfather or grandfather, I know um, a lot of my friend, American friends, when their uh, uncles and grandfathers would cook in lard to make biscuits or whatever, people would, uh, when I was young, would would, uh, would be very upset because it was so unhealthy. Well, it turns out butter is has more saturated fat than lard does. Um, and vegetable oils uh, would tend to be monounsaturated. Olive oil is very good for you. You can see how, mu how much saturated fat it has. Very little. Uh, it has mostly monounsaturated. There's a little poly in there. Omega-3 fatty acids are very good for you. Polyunsaturated omega-3 are probably the best for you. And you see canola, canola oil has a lot of those. It has the least amount of saturated fat. So the best oil for you to eat with is probably going to be canola oil or to cook with. Uh, and of course you can see the rest of these and you can think about they, all of these are sold over the counter in, in grocery stores so hopefully next time you're out there shopping for groceries shopping for oil you're thinking about the type of fat that you're eating and even though there's still kind of con there's still a big controversy over which fat is which fat is the best and which fat is is bad for you well, there's a couple things that we're pretty sure we know and this changes every day because this is science. We go with what works until something shows it different. And as far as we know, uh, we're, when you're talking about uh, trans fats, we know that's bad. We're not sure if fatty acids are bad for you right now, but it's probably a good bet to stick to canola oil because we know that monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and omega-3 fats are good for you, especially omega-3 polyunsaturated fats. So if you're going to cook with an oil, probably canola oil is the one you want to use. So think about it. Uh, of course, there's uh, allergies and other considerations as well, but talk to your parents and think about what kind of oil you're using when you're frying. Uh, by the way, canola oil has a really good taste to it as well. So when we're talking about omega, we're looking at omega-3. We're looking at where where the double bond is so again this is not something I'm going to test so I don't want if you want to skip through this omega fatty acid discussion you, you can but it's very it's I think it's helpful for you to understand how these fats fit into your everyday life when you go shopping and the discussion of people put on commercials and in, and in uh, uh, various restaurants so it's the location of the double bonds when you're talking about omega polyunsaturated fatty acids. 
So the uh, omega, the omega number refers to the position of the double bond nearest the methyl group. So if you have omega three versus omega six, then the omega three is going to be closer to that end, that the end of the fatty acid, that methyl end, that CH three end. So here is uh, an omega three. See, there's so a fatty. There's the double bond closest. There's position uh, one, two, three, third carbon from the end, the omega carbon. Omega means end, right? Mm -hmm. Alpha beginning, omega end, right? And down here you have the sixth carbon, the sixth position away from one, two, three, four, five, six. Six carbon from the end is, so this would be a six, omega six fatty acid. So when you have an omega three poly, uh, poly uh, uh, unsaturated fatty acid, this is, the, this is the best kind of fatty acid you can have for your diet, so, uh, according to a lot of studies. Though again, a lot of this is still up in the air. Hydrogenated. This again, I will not be putting on the test, uh, but it is something that you should be aware of because it has to do with your health. So I, I feel it's it's fair to go ahead and spend some time on it. Fatty acids are it can be hydrogenated, which means you add hydrogen to the unsaturated and unsaturated fatty acid. Food manufacturers do this because it makes food taste better. It makes food last longer. It's cheaper for them to do it this way than to have to. Uh, put a, a shorter time period in where you can keep your fats. It makes it makes the fats solid or firm, which is really good if you're trying to sell a tub of margarine, for instance. Because if you have a liquid margarine, it's it's much more difficult to 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 spread on on, on bread, for instance. People like to spread their their fat on on toast. I know you probably do. When you're putting some butter on toast, you like to be able to put it nice and evenly across your bread. When you hydrogen, hi, hydrogenate the, the oil, it, it keeps it from turning that little oily and the liquid coming out of it. And you've ever seen margarine that starts to separate and you start to get kind of a, a liquid coming out of, out of the, the, uh, the, the paste or the gel. I don't know what you call that, the, 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 the buttery, less solid form. So hydrogenating the, that unsaturated fatty acid like corn oil or canola oil or whatever, by adding hydrogen to it, you make it firmer. And it also, again, increases the stability, protects it against oxidation so it lasts longer. And it's used, that's why the food industry loves to hydrogenate their, their fats, their unsaturated fats, so they can tell you, hey, look, I got, I got corn oil, I got canola oil for you in... Uh, tub of margarine that you could use to cook or you can use it to spread on your butter on your bread uh, and it's it's canola oil so it's good it has a lot of unsaturated fatty acids what they don't tell you is that they've hydrogenated it so they've added the hydrogens back onto those double bonds and so when that again what does that do it increases how well how well it does in cooking for instance when you have hydro hydrogenated corn oil it or or canola oil, you can fry it at higher temperatures. It doesn't go rancid as fast, and it protects it over time. From la it'll last longer in, in the refrigerator, and it doesn't separate. You don't get that kind of watery stuff that you'll see in the in a tub of margarine if you let it sit for a while. If it's not hydro hydrogenated, also it'll happen to hydrogenated oil uh, margins as well. It just it'll take longer. So hydrogenation, what you get is this. here's your there's your double bonds, the ones we want. We want because this is good for you polyunsaturated fatty acids. We know that this is probably good for you. We're not sure if saturated fatty acids are good for you. So when they saturate it, they make it, you know, basically uh, turn it back to being saturated fatty acids, which is not what ideally you'd want to see. But often the fat becomes partially hydrogenated. Now this is full hydrogenation. See, there are hydrogens on everywhere. But when it becomes partially hydrogenated, you get a problem. You get something called, uh, you get the possibility of producing a trans fatty acid. Now that's that problem we were running into with thalidomide, if you remember. So as we're adding, chem as we're chemically changing these polyunsaturated to, to saturate and make them more stable, we'll still have some, some fatty acids polyunsaturated, some will be saturated, but some are going to be in between. They've only partially added hydrogen to these double bonds. And that's not, it turns out that's not good for you. Oil can form a cyst. 
Now we'll look at the cis and, and a trans in a second, but I want to remind you again that in thalidomide, the classic example of, of having this just small conformational change where you have a mirror image of something, all of a sudden you have a drug that can cause a real problem in your body. In, that, in the case of thalidomide, the development of a child. So cis versus trans, in nature, most double bonds are cis, meaning they're, the hydrogens uh, are next to the double bonds on the same side, right? When you get partially hydrogenated because of what we're doing in, chemical, in doing it in a chemical process, and I remember this is done in a big vat, probably the size of, of, our, uh, of uh, all three of our floors at uh, John Hay. They're filled with all these fats, and they're adding chemicals in order to make them the hydrogen, in order to add hydrogen to it again. And chemical, the word chemical is not a bad thing, all right? All processes in nature or done by man are chemicals. Everything is made of chemicals. So I don't want you to think that just because I'm using the word chemical, that that's what makes it bad. It turns out that doing this outside of nature, it turns out that something happens to this fat that we didn't, that we didn't intend to just like in thalidomide, right? So hydrogenated or some double bonds change uh, from cis to trans. And now we got problems because it's not because it's hydrogenated, not because we have saturated fats, but because we've gone to partially hydrogenated. We've added not all of the bonds, not all those available bonds have hydrogen on them, only some or most. And this is the difference. Cis, you have hydrogens on both sides. That's natural. This is what happens when nature makes, makes uh, partially hydrogenated, right? Double bond. If it have, if nature makes it, it looks like cis. When it's trans, when the hydrogen's on this side, this on this side, it's a completely different shape. Now I've said this a million times: structure and function, structure and function. This is yet another example of the structure of a molecule. Now these examples I'm giving you, you need to keep them in your mind because at the end of the year exam, the end of the year exam from the state, this is something that they might ask you. Give you, give me an example of, and something I might ask you for an essay. Let's say. Uh, give me an example of where structure impacts function. And in the case of thalidomide, that, that mirror image, that change in the double, across the double bond, changing it from cis to trans, made thalidomide uh, a teratogen that caused babies to be born with flippers. And in this case, this trans, all right, making it just a little, changing the shape of the molecule slightly, makes this molecule uh, dangerous to eat. And uh, increases your the likelihood of you developing chronic disease. So this is what you want to stay away from. This trans. All right. So that's enough of that. Hope, uh, out of all that, what would you what would you expect to see on the test on Thursday? Gee, I my big thing is, and uh, I would focus on on understanding what's the difference between saturated, unsaturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. That for sure you have to know. I would not worry about which plant has uh, polyunsaturated or, or uh, monounsaturated. I would know that animal fat is saturated. Uh, I would know that you can add hydrogens back onto, the sat onto an unsaturated fat, and that that's called uh, and unfortunately, when we do it in the factories, it, it ends up being that we produce partially hydrogenated. So that means that process isn't complete. And so we end up with molecules that end up being, tr uh, some of them being trans. That cis is, um, is when you have the hydrogens on the same side of the double bond. Trans is when they're opposite sides. Trans opposites. And that the trans is bad for your health. That's what I would know for that out of that whole section. Now, uh, also I would know the carboxyl end. I know a glycerol molecule, all right, because you need to know that triglycerides are made of a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. So you need to know that. So make a little index card or what have you. And again, we'll review next week, but you need to get that in your head so you're ready to go on for the test. So when we're reviewing, it's just like, oh, yeah, I remember now. All right, so phospholipids. Phospholipids are similar to triglycerides, except that they only have two fatty acids instead of three. And instead of using glycerol, they use this molecule called cho choline. We'll take a look at this difference. 
Now remember, uh, glycerol had three little carbons, a real simple molecule with three fatty acids attached to it that was triglyceride. Phospholipids are in foods as well. They're in every cell, actually. Phospholipids are in every cell of your body. I hope you realize, I hope you're thinking already that phospho is you're going to have what functional group? Well, goodness, I hope you said phosphate. And then, of course, the lipid, I'm hoping that you're imagining at this point a long chain of carbons. So phospholipids in, in, in foods, lectin, egg yolks, they're everywhere. So I don't even know why they even... Uh, if it's alive, it has phospholipids because cells, their membranes are made of phospholipids. So this is what it this is what it looks like. Again, there's there's this glycerol, and it's it the root the root molecule is still glycerol. And what happens is, and here's the three carbons: one, two, three. Here, this is still fatty acid. This is fatty acid. Fatty acid. You notice that this one is a saturated one. This was a monounsaturate. But here, instead of having a third fatty acid, instead of having triglyceride, you have a phosphate, and then you have this nitrogen. Uh, it's a negative ion. It's a, I mean, a, it's a positive ion here. The three methyl groups on it. Kind of a, a funky little molecule. But this whole thing is this, co this is choline. This is phosphate. The key is that this uh, this is lectin, right? This is one of the one of the things you can make. And here you have a choline molecule here. So let's take a look at what else you can make. Now this is going to be important in a minute. I'll try to explain it to you. In fact, you'll see it in just a second. So phospholipids, what do they do? They they act as cell membranes. They're the membranes of the cell. This is going to be the first cell structure next week, the week after next, when we start talking about the cell. This is the first cell structure that, uh, that has to form in order to make a cell. You need a cell membrane. You need the thing that divides the outside from the inside. You need a wall. So these phospholipids make that wall, make that, that separation. They help the, the, that phosphate, that phosphate end ends up being charged. And because it's charged, it ends up being water loving. And because it's water loving, it's, it turns out that they're able to take fats and put them in that phosphate end group tends to put fats into solution. So instead of floating on top of the water in a in a layer like it, like you see here, when you see this layer of water and this layer of fat, all right. So here you have a layer of oil or fat, and here you have a layer of water. This is what would happen if you took corn oil and put it on water. If you let it sit for a minute, it'll separate. And this line, this line is where the hydro, the water is separated from the hydrophobic oil. Hydrophobic, the oil is hydrophobic because of those long chains, uh, fatty acids. Now, with a phosphate on the end of that long chain, now all of a sudden you have this molecule, right, that has a phosphate group. So that's charged, right? And that has a negative charge on it. And then you have this these two long fatty acids. These are still nonpolar, right? Right, because they're they're long carbon chains. They're basically long hydrocarbons. They're still not polar. They are hydrophobic, right? Hydrophobic. These are two words you need to know for the test. They're both hydrophobic and nonpolar. Hydrophobic does mean more likely than not that they're nonpolar, that they're afraid of water. Where this end over here is charged. Remember, you can have uh, this is charged. It's a full charge. It's not polar. It's charged. But polar or charged gives you, I hope you said hydrophilic. Hydrophilic. In other words, you're going to love water. Hydrophilic molecules love water. So because this molecule here, this phosphate, is at the end of this thing that you just saw, right? The phosphate being at the end of this thing. It's actually kind of hanging off to the side, but whatever. These two nonpolar hydrophobic ends are going to point away from water, but this one can point towards water. So you start to form these little uh, cells. You end up forming my cells. So again, taking a look at what happens is, is these are the phosphate ends. 
and again you saw it I don't want to draw this is how we draw this these phospholipids here's the phosphate that love water so they'll point outside and they'll point inside and then the lip is the nonpolar ends will point towards each other this is exactly what we saw happen with proteins remember when they were folding remember what happened with the uh, the the nonpolar ends they would point towards each other and the polar ends or ionic ends would point towards water we said that's what would happen and that's what's happening here in phospholipids as well it's the same force it's hydrophobic versus hydrophilic. So you have the glycerol hand. Here's the heads again with the glycerol and the phosphate. Here's your fatty acid tails in the center. See, this is kinking. See how it's bent? That's because there's a double bond here. This is unsaturated, where this one's straight, so it's saturated. So here's that bend over here, so this is unsaturated, and this one's saturated. And this is inside and outside. So this is watery fluid. Water is its base, but there's other stuff outside the cell. There's other stuff inside the cell. But water is the main is the solution on both sides. So the part that points out towards the water is the, as these phosphate glycerol ends. So here again is structure and function, right? How does a cell make a membrane? Because the structure of its tails is such that the chemistry hates water, and so they point towards each other. Like dissolves like, all right. And the polar ends, or in this case ionic ends point towards the inside and outside of the cell. Now, structure of sterols. Now, here's some carbon rings. These are rings of faded carbons we saw. This is, uh, so what we have here is this idea that we, when we make these steroids, often they have these ring structures in the carbon chains. Instead of straight chains or bent, like we just saw with fatty acids, sterols form rings. Sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen, vitamin D, bile that helps digest fats, adrenal hormones, like cortisol, which is a stress hormone, uh, cholesterol, which is in foods, it's made by your liver, it's dietary, it's found in egg yolks, liver, meats, dairy products, are all sterols. All very, very, very important uh, lipid in your body. Obviously, lipids are incredibly important, a very big part of, of a healthy diet is fat and cholesterol uh, of course you want to keep it down to some percentage and we're still kind of trying to figuring we're still trying to figure that out as as as, as far as scientific studies remember when you digest uh, fats just like when you break anything down any of these macromolecules down any of them we're going to do hydrolysis and we know what that means we're going to add water to a bond and that water being added to bond is going to, is going to break it off it's going to break it up and what are, where are we going to add that water? Where is that water going to be added? If you remember back, if you don't remember, rewind and look at it. You can see the tri, in the triglycerides and even, uh, you really didn't see it in the, let me think. Yes, you saw it also in the phospholipids. You can see where the fatty acid is attached to the glycerol. It's that, it's that carboxylic end of the fatty acid. That's where you're going to add the water because that's where you took it out. And when you, when you add the water to it, that fatty acid breaks off. And then so you break, you make a mono, uh, either mono, uh, you have a monoglyceride, you have fatty acids, and you have a glycerol, all right, in the case of, of, of uh, break, the breakdown of triglycerides. So here it is. <coughs> There's that carboxylic acid end. Remember carboxylic acid methyl group from the very beginning of this, uh, of this presentation. And here you're adding water. Let me fit it better in the screen here. So here you have here you have adding water to this. This is the place. This is where we made the bond in the beginning. This is where it's going to be broken off. And when you're done adding water, of course, you have your carboxylic acid end back, your methyl group at the end. There's your fatty acid. This is a what kind of fatty acid? I hope you said monounsaturated fatty acid. And here you have still a uh, glycerol. All right. So it's a monoglyceride plus two fatty acids. Uh, you still have the middle one. When you add two waters to triglyceride, you have one fatty acid left in the middle, and these two fall off. All right? So that's what happens when you digest fats. This is what you make. This glycerol molecule, one fatty acid, and then these two fatty acids. These could be any length. It all depends on... That's, by the way, this is what is the difference in flavor of sunflower seeds, for instance, and pumpkin seeds. And a lot of the flavor com differences come 
from which kind of fatty acid you have on the triglyceride. So every creature makes its own fatty acids. That's why a shark, when, he's, when they're going after a seal, they taste a completely different taste when they eat a seal when, versus when they eat a human. To a human, our, the fat that we produce, the, the, tri, the triglycerides we make are different, to the, have a different taste, and most sharks don't like it. Thank goodness. All right, so let's take this thing. Uh, the very first thing that happens when you start digesting fat is that the fat starts to melt in your mouth, literally. And that's because of lingual lipase. Lipase, li from, uh, from lipid, and ACE is an enzyme. And this starts to do hydrolysis in your mouth. So as soon as you put it in your mouth, just like when you put sugar in your mouth, the very first thing that happens, you have enzymes in your, in your mouth that start to break it down. Your stomach starts to churn and mix it all up. And then there's some gastric lipases. Now, this is a different enzyme from than this. This one works at a higher pH, at a lower pH. This one works at a higher pH. In other words, this works in a, in a, in an in a, re, in a in an environment that has is more acidic, and this one works in an environment that's more basic. Again, we'll talk, cover acids and bases a little deeper later. Then in the, in the small intestine, you start to pancreatic. The pancreas releases some more lipases. The intestines re release more lipases, each one breaking down uh, the fats even more and more. Uh, then the small intestine re uh, releases bile. And what bile does is it makes, it, it allows those fats, those nonpolar large molecules to be surrounded. And what bile does is actually makes it soluble in water so that, so that you can absorb it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right. So here's, uh, here's the fat, right? Uh, and what happens is, the, as, as you're looking at this fat, what happens is, the, uh, get, and this is water, and here's some enzymes. Well, the enzymes can't get to the fat. Because remember what we saw in that little jar just a few uh, moments ago, the fat separates from the water. They don't like to mix. So what happens is that you need to get this stuff broken up, emulsify it. Okay, what's an emulsion? What's an emulsion? If you've ever seen a vinaigrette, uh, if you've ever made mayonnaise, uh, it's when you take something, you surround fat with something that allows it to be in solution. So we can take this, we can take something that something is bile and produce again in your gallbladder. And as that bile, these bile molecules come in, they start to surround the the, the fat. They make little fat balls, emulsified fat, floating in the water. The bile is, is hydro, hydrophilic, the fat is hydrophobic, but now because you're able to make these little tiny fat balls, and you can see it in vinaigrettes, you have vinegar and you have oil, and you mix it up really, really uh, hard, uh, and sometimes it, uh, you'll see in mayonnaise when you mix an egg yolk in it, what happens is that you get this, this these tiny little balls of fat floating around in, in the water. These, these little balls of fat, now those are something the enzyme can attack. And now the enzyme can, can, uh, can ex uh, now the fat's exposed to the enzyme. Now the fat can be digested completely and the, the fatty acids then absorbed. So when you're talking about digestion, there's a complicated set of things that have to happen in order to be able to eat and absorb fats. You can't absorb a fat molecule, a giant piece of uh, fat in a, in, a, in a chunk of meat, a steak that you ate, your, your body has to literally send enzymes and something like, you know, like bile down to make these little spheres of, of, of fat that the enzyme can then attack and break down. Here's, uh, here's the, the, the process. And I don't, do I expect you to know the digestion of fat? No. Um, do I expect you to know uh, emulsification and the idea of that fats are, uh, how fats are digested. Not really, but you should have an idea of what, what's going on, don't you think? It is your body. As you eat the fat, your salivary, your salivary glands and your sublingual salivary, salivary glands start to release enzymes that start to help break it down. Your stomach churns it and breaks it down even more. And as it moves down into your intestine, it goes round and round in your intestine. Bile is removed, is released by your gallbladder. And that bile, which is green actually, 
emulsifies it so that you can your enzymes can in other words makes tiny little spheres in this in this in dissolution so that your body can start absorbing it remember that the stuff that comes into your mouth here it's still it's inside this tube this tube is continuous with the outside so it's still outside your body you have to absorb this material into your body the whole point of the digestive system is to take the stuff that you eat and bring it into your tissues bring it into your cells into your body everything is it's protecting us from all the bad things and absorbing all the good things and the difficulty is to separate the good from the bad and so we're able to break down these things into very small smaller molecules than the macromolecule called a triglyceride we break them down into fatty acids and we can then absorb we can't absorb fats into our into our bloodstream directly they, they get absorbed in acids now, when you're taking these lipids in your, and you're transporting them, they just don't go floating around in solution. You don't have like you don't have like a vinaigrette for blood. What you do is you put them in something called lipoproteins, and lipoproteins is just a mixture of of lipids and proteins, and it's used to transport fats, right? So you have chylomicrons, you have VLDL, LDL, and HDL. High density lipoproteins, low density lipoproteins, and very low lipo, uh, lipo, very low density lipoproteins. And what it is is that you get these proteins in the in the membrane with these all these phospholipids, and you have these little. Uh, let me get this down here, like so. And then let's look at then what's inside these these lipoproteins. And if you ever go to your doctor with your parents, uh, you know, kids are usually not even, they're not even tested for this stuff. But as adults, you'll be tested for these uh, HDL and LDL. Uh, LDL is low density li uh, uh, lipoprotein, so they're not going to have as many proteins in the, in, the, in the lipoprotein. Remember, this lipoprotein is a sphere into which you have these fats. You'll notice that when we're talking about LDLs, they're about this size, the chylomicron is uh is very large a very large ball of emulsified fat and here in these vldls are very low density they're they're almost all fat and this is a chylomicron is pretty much fat and a vldl is is more fat than protein and the ldl is still more fat than protein more fat in any ways than there is an hdl hdl is high density uh uh, lipoprotein, so there's a lot of protein and not a lot of fa uh, less fat than the rest of them. And it turns out the HDL is very good for you and, and LDL very bad for you. Uh, again, it's probably true. Uh, so we're still pretty sure that that's, that's correct. So when you look at the percent of uh, triglycerides in a chylomicron, it's mostly fat. When you look at uh, VLDL, it's still about 50% fat and LDL is still too uh, too high a level of fat versus others where an HDL is it's pretty good uh, as far as percentage of fat it's less than less than 10% uh, when we're looking here though at uh, cholesterol is also another issue uh, dietary cholesterol a lot of people um, uh, it's a lot of the reading that I've done says that you know dietary cholesterol probably doesn't have a large impact on your on your health, but it is good to note that HDL has low low levels of cholesterol, a lot of protein, uh, a lot of uh, phospho uh, less phospholipids, less fat than all the rest of these, and it turns out that LDL levels of LDL and VLDL in your blood it turns to be it turns out it's 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 uh, highly correlated with heart disease. So if you, the more HDL you have, the better percentage of HDL to LDL, v, VLDL. Uh, the, you, what you want is you want to have more HDL than you do all the rest of these. So am I going to put this on the test? No, I'm not going to put uh, any of this lipopro. We will cover it in more detail later, especially when we start looking at cells. And will be on later exams, but it won't be on this exam. I just want to introduce you to the idea of this is how fats are put into your blood. This is how the, this is all related to your health. 
So don't panic if you're watching this and saying, oh my God, how am I saying? You know, the only thing you have to worry about with lipids on the exam on Thursday is the structure of, of what is a fat, that, it's a, uh, that, that glycerol molecule with the three fatty acids. What is a phospholipid? That it's two fatty acids with a glycerol molecule and a phosphate instead of a third fatty acid, right? And the sterol that has those ring structures. So the sterols are your hormones in your body. So those are the three that are going to be on the test. The digestion of fats that we've been discussing, how fats work into your body, how they work into your health, is, is to introduce you to those concepts. And I will taste probably test it later but if this is more for your information and to help you become a more educated person uh, and also if they ever if anyone ever throws you a test on a test question on it you'll have some background knowledge on it all right so fats what are some of the fat functions of fats this will be on the exam right so why, what do we do fat for in your body? Why are we absorbing it? Why is it so essential? And I've kind of hinted at it already. Uh, it provides energy for the cell. It's long-term storage of energy. And it's about 60% of your body's energy comes from fats. So this is incredibly important. Uh, when you're sleeping, you're pulling, that, you're pulling your calories from fat. Uh, it's stored in your fat tissue, in the tissue called adipose, right? We use it for insulation, which explains why I, you, some of you skinnier folk are so, always cold and some of us that are more insulated are not as cold. Uh, and of course, the cell membranes of every cell in your body is made of fat, phospholipids specifically. All right, so in food, you know, again, it's a it's a it's a source of energy. It gives food flavor and smell, and it makes meat tender and even some uh, fruits and vegetables. It provides uh, that's that sensation of being full comes a lot of times from this fat. It uh, carries a lot of the vitamins uh, that you absorb. A, D, E, and K can only be absorbed if you're eating it with fat. If you're not eating it with fat, then you're not going to be able to absorb these vitamins. And it provides a source of essential fatty acids, fatty acids we can't make. These five things are very important and you should know for the exam. All right. What are essential fatty acids? This I'm not going to test, but realistically it's a good idea you should know so if you're some of you are trying to be vegetarians and you're wonder and I always wonder do they know what kind of fats they're gonna need uh, what kind of protein what kind of amino acids they need because there's essential amino acids there's essential uh, uh, fatty acids that you're not gonna find in every vegetable and so it's key when you eat meat you're te you tend to be uh, well nourished because you have almost all these fats and proteins and amino acids in that in that mood in that food when you start to limit your diet which may be good or bad i'm not making that decision for you but when you start to limit your diet it you need to consider the essential fatty acids and essential amino acids so linole linoleic uh uh and linoleic and uh, uh omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids all right these two and we saw them earlier in this in this presentation are essential to your diet they're found in plants oil plant oils nuts seeds and whole grains we can't make these these omega-6s and omega-3s uh, they play a role in our normal growth development and prevent heart disease hypertension arthritis and cancer so again if you're going to choose foods that have, have fats this is the kind of fat you want to be eating we know this is true. What the percentage is, what happens uh, when you eat cholesterol, no cholesterol, high, you know, saturated fats versus unsaturated. That's all kind of. It's it's still up in the air right now. There's, they're they're pinning it down, uh, but conservative wisdom would have you do eat uh, unsaturated fatty acids and stick with omega six, and omega three fatty acids, and stay away from trans fatty acids. So, where do you find these acids? Well, you'll find a lot of these fatty acids in vegetable oils, like uh, and as far as linoleic, uh, in things like safflower, soybean oil, poultry, poultry or chicken fat, right? Nuts and seeds. 
uh, which makes sense because birds eat seeds, so you'd, you'd probably find those fatty acids in there. Uh, this fatty acid here, about finding meats, poultry, and eggs, can be made from from linoleic acid, uh, and I'm not sure if your body makes that or not. All right, but and these are fatty acid that you need. Linoleic acid again, omega threes can be found in oils like canola oil, walnut, wheat germ, soybean. So if you're thinking about being a vegetarian, you see all the different kinds of nuts and and vegetables you're going to have to eat. Uh, these two fa uh, acids can be found in human milk and of course oysters and fish, mackerel, bluefish, mullet. So you don't have to drink uh, human milk. You can uh, you can find fish, find in sardines and tuna or some other. Uh, and, uh, fish or seafood. If you don't like seafood, uh, you know it looks like your it looks like your your body can make it. All right. Excess fat contributes to a lot of diseases. Uh, obesity uh, is an issue when you're eating a lot of fat. There's a lot of calories. If you're not burning them off, it could lead to obesity. It can lead to diabetes, probably mostly from, from obesity. Uh, cancer, it's an issue, again, unless you're eating the healthier fatty acids. This kind of, this kind of information, though, may be out of date. Uh, I hate presenting it. This, traditionally, this is what we've been taught. Uh, as I said, it's the kind of fat you have to worry about and less fats, right? So I don't like this title. When we're talking about heart disease, uh, we're talking about saturated fat and we're talking about and maybe not even saturated fat but probably saturated fat and probably and definitely trans fat um, so when we when we know that when we eat high saturated fat there tends to be a raise in blood cholesterol uh, not we're not sure if that means if that's because people haven't separated saturated fat from uh, from from trans fat, so some of those studies are still being fine-tuned, and we'll see what happens in, in the next uh, few years. And so, and a lot of people think that high fat intakes promote cancer, but again, it's probably the trans fat that's doing this. And so, these these facts, we're not sure about yet. So, I don't like the I don't like this title, but I'm going to go ahead and state it and tell you that you should be thinking and keeping an eye on the news and figuring out to figure out what your diet for your future should be. See, I think that there's two things you should be thinking about when you're watching this video. The first is, of course, your exam and what is going to be on the exam and what isn't. This won't be. The second thing is, what should I be thinking about for my own health so that I can live as long, as healthy as I can for as long as I can? Uh, because as you get older, a lot of people get sick and, you know, it's not always about how, how early you die. It might be how well you live that makes a difference for yourself. So be thinking about these fats and, and which fat to eat and which one not to eat and what's the difference between LDL and HDL so that when you're as you start to age as you start to get in your 20s and even into your late 20s early 30s you're making wise decisions and you're you end up being a healthier person because of it so your biggest the risk that you're looking at the things you have to worry about from from lipids and for sure trans fats I mean guaranteed this is an issue. I mean, as far as I can tell, there's no question in my mind that trans fats you have to try to stay away from. Unfortunately, it's in McDonald's french fries, by the way, so good luck with that. Uh, risk from cholesterol? Probably not a high risk from dietary cholesterol. So you're eating cholesterol itself. Studies have shown recently that cholesterol probably isn't a giant risk. Saturated fats, as I said throughout the video, it's a big question now, and they're trying to figure that out. So as of now, try to stay away from these. Stick to monounsaturated and polyunsaturated. We know those are probably good for you. Probably minimize this a little bit, although some studies have shown that eating cholesterol isn't that big a deal. But trans fats, definitely stay away from. This is the monster which are pretty sure is no good for you. So think about that when you're, make, when you're making purchases decisions for your food. So... Here's just some I, some pieces of information where you find cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol is important for your cells. And again, it's still up in the air as to whether dietary cholesterol really makes a big difference in your blood, uh, the level of cholesterol in your blood. We do know that high cholesterol in your blood is linked with heart disease. Now, 
And it would be intuitive to think that if you eat a lot more cholesterol, then your blood, blood cholesterol is going to be uh, higher. But as it turns out, you make your own cholesterol too. So if you eat less, your body tends to make more of it. And if you eat more of it, your body tends to make less, of, eat less, or make less of it. So cholesterol may be more genetically determined than it is environmentally determined. Or maybe that it's the fats that you eat that determine how that, how that whole mechanism, uh, that homeostatic mechanism works out and you end up with higher cholesterol. We're, this is a big question. So then on this whole thing, you know, when we're, when we're talking about, uh, you know, cholesterol and we're talking about, uh, and we're talking about saturated fats, there's just this giant question mark as to what, what's going to happen. This is, you have to, we have to keep our eyes on the, on the news and do, do some reading and, and, you know, keep, keep up with the, with the latest studies to find out what exactly is the truth and what's the best way of eating when it comes to cholesterol and, and saturated fats. Uh, but for sure, when we're talking about trans, uh, trans fats, we want to stay away from them. All right, I hope you enjoyed the, this, uh, this uh, mini presentation. It's not mini, it's a long presentation. I hope that you understand that the, what you need, to, uh, when you need from this on the exam, what is not necessary. Uh, a lot of the dietary stuff and the health stuff is for you and for you to start making some intelligent decisions on how you want to eat and how you want to live your life. All right, my my children, I, I think I'll be done with this. And the next video I'm going to send you is going to be on the uh, uh, forest, forest, forest succession. And uh, hopefully it will be a lot shorter than this.